Hi everybody, I'm Tim from TroutandFeather.com and in this fly tying video I'm going to show you how to tie a really great looking crayfish pattern. Stay tuned. Let's start tying this furry foam crayfish. In my Stonfo Transformer vise, I have a hook from Allen Fly Fishing. This is their S402BL. It's a heavy nymph hook. It's a size 8. Uh, I'll fish this pattern anywhere between sizes 6 to a size 10. Uh, this is a really great hook. I tie a lot of patterns on it, and it works perfectly for this one. As you can see, I've already put a few things on the hook. For starters, I put a little bit of lead wire, size 020. I put about 8 to 10 turns of that. And then I added a set of dumbbell eyes. The dumbbell eyes, let me see if I can show you the packaging, are extra small, size 5 30 seconds. I tied those in with some ADOT brown uni thread. I'm getting really low on this spool. After we have that tied in, I'm simply going to push the, the lead wire up just a little bit and just hold on to the thread, lock everything in place, create a nice smooth transition point. And then next, we're going to tie in the material that kind of gives its fly this uh, gives gives this fly its name, and that's furry foam. This is a really cool material. This comes in a sheet, and what you have to actually do is pull the two sides apart from one another. There's a back side of it; it's a little shiny, and then there's a furry side. We want this furry side to be on the outside. So what I've already done is I've cut a, a little strip out. Here's what the strip looks like. I'm going to be tying it in so the furry side is down because we're going to be wrapping this over the hook shank. Now I've, I've left it intentionally long just to have ready for this video, though I do want you to notice the width. I prefer the width to be about the same width as the hook gap, or maybe a little bit more. So let's just lock this in. I'm going to have to be very sparse with my thread, don't want to run out. Okay, and once we have that locked in, near the back of the, the shank, I'm immediately going to tie in a little bit of tan chenille. I've pulled off some fibers off of the end. And now we're going to lock that in place. All right, the next material is probably one of the most important. It's going to be a fox squirrel tail. Now we're going to be using this to create the pinchers, and it really gives just a great profile, a great look, and it's, this is a wonderful color to use. So I'm just going to pull about we'll say a healthy clump out. Once I have that clump, I'm going to grab a pair of scissors. These are scissors that we would use to cut wire with. We don't want to dull our regular fly tying scissors. So I have this clump in my hand. I'm going to hold it by its tips first, and I'm going to get all this excess stuff out. Now, I'll also advise you, do this over a garbage bag or your, your little trash can. Then I'm going to actually hold it by the tips a little further up, just pull all these excess fibers out. They really will bulk up the, uh, the materials on this fly, and we really don't want them there. Now once we have all that excess out of the way, I'm going to break this into two clumps. Now if you want to stack these to even out their tips, you definitely can. I don't worry too much about that. All right, once I have these, these two stacks, I'm going to tie these in with like an X pattern over the top. Now I know a lot of beginner to, um, we'll say beginning intermediate tires watch these videos. So I'm going to tie them in one at a time because that's what I would recommend to that beginner tire. Though if you're a little more proficient, you can easily tie them both in at the same time. For the length of these pinchers, I want them to be about the, a little bit less than the hook shank. So kind of get an idea where that's, that's going to be. If you notice, I'm tying them just a little bit back. You'll see why here in a little bit. So I'm wrapping forward. And you can see I have this first of the two X's on. And now, if, we're, if, if I've left them in a little long, I could always shorten them up or, or uh, vice versa. But at this point, what I want to do is take my thread and wrap around the pincher side, kind of a helicopter style. Think about tying a parachute post. And I just want to trap those fibers in. I want to make sure that I really have them securing together in one clump. I'm not sure if it's going to be great for you to see this side, but I'm just holding that clump in my, in my right hand, and I'm just binding them together 
with the thread. We only need about th three or four turns just to hold them in place. And now if you look at that pincher going down, it looks really, just really significant there. For all these excess butt ends, you can just get those out of the way. Now we're going to do the same thing with that other clump that we set to the side. We can measure them off the first one, make sure we have the approximate length, tie them in again X style. Check the length. If everything looks okay, and they're actually a little long, so I'm just going to pull the butt ends just a hair. I want to go back over those butt ends, make sure they're not going to move, and then just like before, I'm going to grab this this side of the pincher and start forming these, as I'm going to call, helicopter wraps around them, just to make sure I keep all those fibers together. All right. Once I have all those fibers together, I can just move my thread forward and advance it. I'm going to get rid of all the excess. at least attempt to. And at this point, we're kind of on the downswing of this fly. I'm going to try to even all this stuff out just so I make a smooth transition for my chenille. And the one final addition that we're going to make, we're going to add some rubber legs. There's a great color for this pattern. It's called Crawdad, Crawdad Pumpkin Flake. Looks really awesome. We're going to tie these in similar to those pinchers. We're just going to put them in a little X pattern. There's one. And here's our second one. We'll leave them intentionally long right now. And we can trim those once we have everything finished. I'm just going to advance my thread forward. I'm going to get it on the eye side of those dumbbell eyes. And finally, we're now going to bring our chenille forward. We have to be careful. We want to make sure we have touching wraps. We really want to make sure we don't bind any of the materials down. To me, this is probably one of the most critical parts of everything. I'd like to get a couple wraps in before those pinchers. And we don't want anything showing underneath. All right, it's coming out really well. All I need is really one wrap in front of these eyes just to lock everything in place. We'll get our chenille out of there. Now, at this point, if you're just starting to tie this fly, I will, will immediately tell you, take a look at the bottom, make sure none of that lead wire is showing through. There's nothing worse than having that lead wire showing through just kind of I'm not saying lowering the quality of the fly, but it's a little disappointing if you're going for really that, that nicely finished fly. Now I'm going to take this furry foam, I'm going to bend it over the top of the shank, and I'm going to lock it in place just with a few wraps. I'm going to bend it back, and now we can immediately go to our whip finish. I'm going to put two in because I know this fly is definitely going to be banging on the bottom. It's going to run into some rocks. Those fish are very aggressive with it. So we want to do our best to retain all these materials. And we're going to have a few cuts to make now. Got rid of our thread. For this furry foam, we don't want to trim it right at that point. We want to let this extend a little bit, similar, similar to a crayfish and all that armor of theirs. And then finally, with these legs, we can trim those relatively short. And there we go. We have our finished furry foam crayfish. I'll give you a quick 360 look of this fly. I think I have a little fiber right there that I got to get out of there. Otherwise, this fly came out really nice. We have those prominent dumbbell eyes that are going to help to invert the hook. We have those really cool looking pinchers in the back. We have those rubber legs. 
very representational of a crayfish in that sense that it's going to give the approximate silhouette and it's going to give the fish something to really think about when they see this, this sucker coming down that riffle towards them. So with that said, let me change the camera angle a little bit and we'll talk a little bit more about this cool little furry foam crayfish pattern. Let's talk about this furry foam crayfish a little bit more from a fly tying perspective first. Well, when we take a step back and we look at the materials that are used to tie this fly and some of the techniques required, I think we can all agree that this is a pretty simple fly to tie that just gives a great impression when it's in the water. In fact, it kind of brings to mind these letters that I'm kind of seeing all over the place right now. They seem to be these in vogue letters in fly fishing and fly tying. And it's G-I-S-S, -S, which stands for General Impression of Size and Shape. And this is one of those flies that would absolutely fall into that category because there's probably not a smallmouth or a large brown trout out there that's going to say that this crayfish is an exact replica of one of the ones that they normally eat. But if it's moving really fast in the water in a riffle, more than likely they're going to come up to it and they're going to smack it because it's going to look pretty much like a crayfish as long as they don't have too much time to inspect it. Now, the one thing I want to stress with tying this fly, if you don't have all the materials that I use in the video, you know, real, don't stress out. You don't have to go out and purchase them all right away. More than likely, you have some materials at your bench right now that you can substitute in their place. And by all means, use them and see if you have success with them. More than likely, you're going to. Also remember that the sizes that I listed at the beginning of this video are just suggestions. They're sizes that I use most frequently in my boxes, but if you're running into a population of crayfish in the waters you fish that are smaller or larger, then make sure you tie those accordingly. Don't just go by what everyone says on the internet. You have to go by what you're seeing and what you're experiencing on those rivers and those streams that you fish. Now, when we talk about making this fly your own, don't be afraid to change things up. I can tell you there's two really common revisions that I make on a regular basis with this pattern. If I'm in a rush, I'm gonna leave those rubber legs off. They look great on the fly. I think they really might give off a nice vibration in the water, especially slower moving waters. But if I'm in a bind and I gotta crank out a few of these before a fishing trip, I'm probably gonna leave those off. And I can tell you, I still have success with the fly. The other thing that sometimes I'll commonly do is leave off those lead eyes. Now, tying lead eyes on top of the hook shank are great because they automatically will invert that hook and allow it to ride hook point up, basically so you won't snag as much if you have a bottom that's just littered with tree limbs and all kinds of stuff for your hook to grab onto. But again, if I'm in a rush, or if I know I'm not gonna be fishing in an environment where I really have to get that fly down super deep, I'll leave those lead eyes off and I'll still have success with this fly. Now, the last thing that I wanna mention is the furry foam that I used in this. And that is one thing that if you don't have, I'm gonna make the recommendation that you go out there and get, but don't be like me. Don't buy every single color that they make. That's what I first did when I first started tying this pattern. And I thought, yeah, this is gonna be great. I'm gonna be tying this crayfish in all these different colors. They're gonna look great. I did, most of them didn't work for me. There are two colors that I use on a regular basis on this pattern, sometimes a third. Without a doubt, my favorite color to have is tan. I just think this looks great on the fly. It looks great whenever it's wet and in the water. So by all means, I recommend, I encourage you to get tan. And also, there's another color that I just love to use, and it's rust. Those are the two colors that I easily use the most. Here are three other colors that I use occasionally. One's just a dark brown, one's orange, and one's olive. Do these three work? Sure. Do I use them that much? <laughs> no. So if, I'm, if you're, you're kind of listening to what I'm saying here, don't go out, don't be like me and waste all of your money on all these different furry foams. Just try a couple, see how they work, and if they're working, stick with them. Don't be afraid. You don't have to go down all those other avenues. Just keep it simple by all means. I think these cost around $2, maybe a little less than $2 a piece, so you don't have too much money invested in this fly. But by all means, it's an easy one to tie. Get some furry foam and see how they look. Now let's kind of shift gears a little bit and talk about this fly from a fishing perspective. Well, fishing this furry foam crayfish is almost as easy as tying it. Let's try to keep it simple. I tie it on 3X or 4X, and I prefer to fish it in really fast moving water. We're talking about riffles. The deeper, the better. But with that depth, we have to really keep a couple things in mind. For starters, I wanna select flies that have more wire on them, more of that lead to really get them down to the bottom. I want those flies with lead eyes, and I wanna make a tuck cast, because that tuck cast will really allow that fly to dive into the water and get down into the water column 
in a hurry. Now, a couple things to keep in mind once we're fishing those riffles. You don't need a strike indicator because when those smallmouth and brown trout see this fly coming, they're not gonna nibble. They're really going to slam it and you'll feel that. Just keep a tight line and lead the fly through the riffle. Now, if you're fishing through a relatively deep riffle and you really wanna get a second fly on there to get it down, by all means do it. I love to fish two of these crayfish at a time and to do that, it's pretty simple. We just tie our first one, we'll say a tan, onto that 3X or 4X and then I'll tie about a 12 to 18 inch piece of tippet off of the bend of that hook and then I'll tie in the rust colored one. Then I'll fish those two together, but we're not gonna use a tuck cast. That tuck cast really causes them to dive into the water. And if they dive in one after another, there's a really good chance that that tippet can get a little tangled up and you'll have a giant mess on your hands. So make a little bit more of a lob in a sense. And whenever you fish those ones through, again, lead them through the same way. And if you're catching more fish on one color than the other, then by all means, switch them both to that color. The nice thing about fishing two patterns is that A, you get a little bit more depth but B, that first fly might capture the fish's attention. And if it's moving really quick and that fish is now turned, they'll see that second one coming through and hopefully they'll slam it and you'll catch that fish. So by all means, get out there and try this crayfish pattern. It's a great one and one of my favorites. With all that said, I really do hope that you enjoyed learning a little bit more about this furry foam crayfish. If you'd like to watch more of my fly tying videos, you can check them out at my website, which is troutandfeather.com. I also have a Facebook page, and if you like that, you'll be able to see some of my regular fly tying and fly fishing updates. If you have any questions or comments, you can leave them in the comments section below, or you can email me at tkamisa at gmail.com. For those of you who have tied a crayfish pattern before, if you could mention it in the comments section below, talk about the colors that you've used, maybe the specific pattern, just so we can start to see what patterns other guys are using out there because more than likely, this is a great crayfish pattern, but I'm 100% confident that there's so many others out there that you guys are using and I'd love to hear a little bit more about them. Well, once again, thank you so much and I hope you enjoyed this video on the furry foam crayfish.